Vitali, the leader of the Get Social and the world class uh, speaker at the TEDx and world class uh, like DevFest and something like that. And that's it. The app development, everything. If you know, if you know, it's it's Vitali. <laughs> Let's get started, Vitali. It's yours. myself. Can you hear me now? I believe yes. Welcome everyone. I'm super excited to be in Prague. It's my first time in Czech Republic. Thank you Dominic for introduction and today we are going to talk about how not to fuck up with building libraries. But before we are going to start let's play a quick game of hands. Who of you are here developers? Okay that's a good number. Now you are developers. Probably you ever integrated a library or a third-party service into your projects? Who did that? Good number of people. We are in the right audience. How often did you have uh, the situation when you integrate something, but suddenly it doesn't work? It didn't meet your expectation? It doesn't work as good as it you expected? Or just the integration process is so complex that you gave up in the middle of the integration? Today, we are going to talk about how to make you, as a client of some library of a service, happy. We are going to look on the development from a bit different perspective, rather than we used to do. But before that, let's figure out who the hell am I and why I'm here on the stage. My name is Vitaly Zasadny, and I started my career in development long, long time ago in my student life. I used to write enterprise applications, with huge enterprise JBoss servers. I used to write 3D games. And now I am switched to writing services for games. Besides that, I, am, I started a Google developer group in Lviv, in Ukraine. You may know us as organizers of DevFest Ukraine that we actually finished two weeks ago. And I'm a public speaker. I truly believe that IT community will benefit a lot if everybody is going to share their experience, their knowledge that they got and their day-to-day -day projects. So I travel a lot. Nowadays, I'm leading mobile development at the Dutch startup called Get Social. We are building social layer for mobile apps and games. We are providing a single integration library with, that allows you with few lines of code at newsfeed, at referral program, or a social graph to your mobile app application or game. And today, I want to share with you our experience, our experience of building libraries for all major platforms like Android, Unity, iOS for the last four years. And the first takeaway that I, I like to get from this session is that if you want to build a high quality product, you have to put yourself in your customer's shoes. You have to understand the problems that your customers have. You have to understand like, what kind of problem you try to, sol to solve with your uh, service or your library. And that applies not only to services or libraries, it applies to any application development you are doing in your day-to-day -day job. And you may ask, Vitaly, we are on developer conference. Why the hell you are talking about product development, about user feedback, about user design on a developer conference? Today I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you to look at the development from a different perspective, to put yourself on the other side, on your customer side. I'm going to share with you learnings that we found uh, while developing our library, what kind of problems we had with our clients, and how did we solve them. And the reason why you should do that more and more often, because understanding your product, understanding your client problems makes you a better developer. Understanding the why you're building your product is going to make your life much easier and will allow you to build much better products at the end. And when I just started my career, I used to develop small libraries. For instance, my first project was that validations library. It was like basic form validations library for Android that I wrote for one of my blog posts. I pushed it to GitHub and I, so I hoped, yes, the fame is going to come. Like, people will just rush to my repository, download, and I'm going to be in all applications around the world. 
But instead of that, I got a bunch of support tickets. I got a bunch of feature requests. I found that the moment of development is just a very early stage. It's the only first part of the life cycle of the any mobile library or ap application. There are much more stuff behind it. And today we are going to look at the other parts of the library or a service lifecycle, like integration process, how your users are going to integrate your library, how you are going to provide support for your clients, how you are going to provide updates for your library. First step is development. But we are all developers, we know how to write code. I'm not going to focus much if you have questions about how do we develop our SDKs at the get social, feel free to ping me after the uh, presentation. But now we are going to start talking about integration. I'm going to tell you a story. Our library has a lot of features. And integration process on the early days of our library was fairly cumbersome. Like just to add basic functionality of inviting people to the application with our library, you had to add app ID to your manifest. You had to find main activity, go to our dashboard, copy values from our dashboard into your activity, add metadata, add some providers for, image pro for images for inv invites. You had to provide some receivers for analytics. And to top up all that, you had to initialize everything manually. Quite a lot of stuff to do just to do very basic thing, to call one method to show invitation window. Don't you, don't you think so? The most funny part was this one, install refer receiver. Have you ever heard about install refer receivers? Like on Android, that Google Play is broadcasting that app was install, installed. Like maybe some of you. So this receiver was doing one important thing. It was collecting the information that app was installed and reporting it to our analytics. For our library functionality, it didn't really matter much. The library was working without it. If developer forget to put this part of code, it's fine, library will, will work. But the problem was that, that we were billing our clients depending on the analytics reported by our library. There is now this line of code. Oops, this line of code. There is no profit in our company. So those complexity in the integration process was not impacting only the functionality of the library. It was impacting the complete feasibility of the business as itself. How did we solve that? To start with, to solve particularly this problem, we started with very simple manifest merging. At that time, we were shipping our library as AAR, like Android application ar archive. And in Android application archives, you can provide parts of the manifest that that are going to be merged into your main application at the end. And that solved this problem. That was the first step that solved at least the business part of the problem. But remember, in the manifest, you, we also had to copy some values from the dashboard. And that's not going to work with the Android manifest merging. So we went to the next step. We wrote a simple Gradle plugin. You probably all used to use a Google Play services. Just apply one line in uh, manifest, uh, in manifest, in your build Gradle file, and all the dependencies, everything will be configured automatically. And that's exa exactly what we did. Now you can, to integrate our library, you just have to first apply Gradle plugin, second provide app ID for our library. That's it. After that, Gradle plugin is going to go to our API, fetch all the configuration, find all the manifests, do all the modifications, depending on a lot of different configurations. All this will be done manually. There is no way how developer can fuck up with integration now. Don't we, right? But we can go in further. If you ever worked with Firebase or with uh, Crashlytics, Crashlytics is also Firebase now, but like in early days, I was truly fascinated how integration with Crashlytics was working. They were providing a Android Studio plugin where you can actually log into your account and just select, I want to integrate this up, even simpler. If you want to learn more about writing Android Studio, Studio plugins, stay in this room. There is a guy behind 
who is getting ready to rock the stage right after me and talk more about the development of Android Studio plugins. That can simplify a life for your clients even more. Let's talk now about this init method. Like it doesn't like we found that there are very few cases where you don't want to initialize your library. So by default, let's initialize it automatically. And the simplest way to do that, like the problem with auto initialization is that you have to find an entry point, an entry point to your application. And the first thing that comes to your mind is overriding an application class, right? Just override application and on create of application, you can uh, initialize your library. But then we get to the problem again. We want to simplify the life of our developers. And overriding a class, putting this class into manifest, it doesn't look like simplification at all. But what you can do, you can provide a content provider that is going to initialize everything like your library before. It was, like, we saw this functionality for the first time in Firebase, and I was really curious, how, did, how do they do? Because they also need to initialize their library to do all this automatic analytics that they're doing for us. That they are doing for us. We digged into their source code, and they were using content provider that was not designed for initialization of libraries at all, to init their library. And the way how it works, Content providers are initialized before any other part of your application. They initialize before you receive any broadcast message, before your application is started. It's the first entry point for your application. And you can create your one, ignore all the methods that it asks you to write, and just get the context and do all the magic instead of your users. And Simplification of integration process, simplification of amount of code that developers are writing is very crucial for you because the less code developer have to write to integrate your library, the less mistakes he's going to make, the less copy-paste he's going to do. And as a result, less bugs in his end application and less problems with integration of your library at the end. You have to understand that the, you have to design your API, your library in a way the developer has to write the least amount of code possible. And when you think in that way to write as less code as possible, you can get into other side of the development, like other trap. You can try, like what we did, we started merging the methods, the use cases that developers commonly use together. For instance, we, had, we have user authentication. And with our library, we can authenticate with Facebook. And what we did, like, when we authenticate with Facebook, we thought, well, we have all this Facebook metadata. Let's update our profile automatically from Facebook. Like, almost all developers do that. Why not? And on one of our clients, we're preparing to the Halloween, and they had some zombie shooting game. They integrated new version of our library with this functionality when you log in with Facebook and automatically get your profile updated. And on one of the mor mornings, I got an email. Why the hell all my users with in the game that used to be called like zombie one, two, three, the hell scary zombie, and stuff like that, are named Vitaly Zasadny or with the real names. <laughs> so be careful with what functionality you are merging. Be careful with use cases you are merging together, because from time to time you may uh, combine too much stuff together and you'll create some API surprises for your clients that you have to try to avoid. Uh, Java, for instance, has a very common or very popular uh, example of this API surprise. Maybe you heard of thread interrupted methods. You know what it's doing? Like in, if you are running a thread, it's, you can call this method to get the current status of the thread and clear it. Let's read it once again. The method thread.interrupted is going to return you a current status of the thread and clear it. What? Why the hell it should clear it? It doesn't, like, from the method signature, it doesn't say that at all. So try to make your API not like some unexpected, exciting. Try to make your API as boring as possible so developer always know what to expect from it and don't do stupid mistakes. 
afterwards. Okay, now let's talk about actually the process of writing your code. Imagine you are a developer and you started integrating some library and there is no movie playing. Whoops, maybe I should press something here. Well, if you are a developer and you start integrating a library and you start importing something, you press like am.getsocial. And then you get like tons and tons of different classes. You have no idea w which classes you should use, which you shouldn't. So when you are developing a library, when you are designing a library, try to hide inter internals. Because if developer will use some libraries, uh, some classes that are not public accidentally, but they are solving their problem, you are going to face the problems with updating your library later on. Because you don't care, like you consider that your private API can be changed without some defined developer. You change it, you update the library, you break compatibility. That's the things you, you try to avoid. What we started doing from SDK version 5, we started putting all our internal, uh, our private API into internal package. Like now we have im.getsocial.allpublic API, and we have package called internal, and all internal private classes are hidden in there. At least we are explicit with developers that don't touch these classes. They are not for you. Uh, another tip, Android Studio or IntelliJ by default, when you generate a code, we like to generate code, it uh, puts all access modifiers to public. Just change it to private to make sure you are not exposing some private API again to your clients. And as a side effect of internal package, when you are generating uh, Java documentation for your library, you can easily specify one simple pattern, like generate documentation for everything except internal package. In our case, it was <laughs> a real pain in this in the older versions of the library, because we used to have a filter of what, like we were, we were adding, we, we had a filter like generate documentation only for these classes and ignore everything else. And it always happens that we added new class, we added new method, and we just forgot to add it to our API reference, and then developers like, hmm, I don't see documentation for that, sorry. So a documentation and generating Java docs from internal package simplifies your life a lot. And there is much, much more about public API design. If you want to dig deeper, I highly recommend to read at least the book from the creator of NetBeans API, he describes in details, particularly like why you, how you should expose your API, how to make it flexible, how to make it extensible for future use. And if you're interested more into the stories, into decision making, into how to expose public API, read the second book from the authors of .NET Framework. They discuss in details why did they do certain decisions in .NET Framework over other decisions. Whether I don't have to take photos, slides will be published right after the talk. Okay, we went over API design. Now we integrated our library, our service into our application. And suddenly we started seeing crash reports in our Google Play Developer Console. How are you going to feel about that? Like this? Usually, that's the developer that sees these reports, and after that, in this state, they write support tickets to you, like, why the hell are you crashing my application, like, in a such a simple case? So when you are developing a client library, try not to crash your host app. I believe you as a, like, application developers, you don't want to see crash logs from Facebook SDK or from Get Social SDK, or from whatever SDK you are integrating in. You expect the perfect stability from the library. And a few tips how we at least at Get Social did uh, to prevent crashes in our application. First, we designed a single entry, like single collection point for all our error messages. Like we started using Rx Java, and in Rx Java, all your error messages get popped up to the like layers that you want to handle them. That's very easy to have one single place where you are going to handle all your exceptions. 
you're going to log them somewhere or you're going to report to analytics or, or whatever you're going to do, but you're going to have a single point where you're handling all your exceptions. Use a lot of static code analysis tool, like PMD, find, find box, error prone, lint, whatever comes to your mind, static code analysis tools can save your time, life, and money for your business later on. It can prevent you from the super stupid mistakes that you can do just mechanically. And finally, we added something we call development mode. And development mode in some, like, in our case is, I mentioned that we collect all errors in one single place. And we have something called execution policies. First one, if, like, if when we are developing library, we are, call, we are using something called strict execution policy. If any exception is happening, it just crashes. Like, all the application crashes, we see all the stack traces, so we can see the problem instantly, and we can fix the problem instantly. But when we are shipping our library to our clients, we use something called silent execution policy. And silent execution policy is, instead of crashing the app, it's just going to quietly log the error message to the log, so developer can report it to us or see it in their analytics and don't stop the execution of the host application. But if your application actually crashed, or your library actually crashed someone's application, you're going to start getting support tickets from your clients. And to simplify your life, like you as a client of the library, you want to always know how you can reach, how you can like, ping this developer to fix that hell issue. And you have to give a voice to your users. Simplest, like if you're publishing your library on a GitHub or any public repository, just use their tools. They are super convenient, they provide you all issue tracking, they provide you all the status reporting on the ticket. If you are more sophisticated, you can use, uh, or you have time to reply to your clients in real time, try to use services like Intercom that provide a chat functionality right in your documentation, in your dashboard, so the developer can instantly reach you and report the problem. Or just support email. Something, the very basic thing that all we as a client developers can do to provide to our clients. And when you'll provide your support email, you create some issue tracking system, you'll notice that you're getting repetitive questions. You're going, to, you're going to get the same questions like, why should I put this line in the code? Is this library compatible with Android version 2.3? Is, like, do we need to add some internet permissions or anything else to, your, to our manifest to make our application work? And to answer those repetitive questions, it's good to have some kind of documentation. And, and okay, okay, I know that we are all developers. We don't like to write documentation, don't we? Are there anyone who likes to write documentation? <laughs> okay, people, I like you. You are the first audience who are actually people who like write documentation. But I believe that having at least some kind of documentation is better than having nothing. If you are writing a documentation for your application, just write a simple integration guide. Just write a simple how to integrate, how to report, how to fix some common problems. Uh, that's going to help your developers, your clients a lot. And some keep, if you're ready to go and develop library like further, to take it a step further in documentation, you have to think at least three parts of that you should have in your documentation. First is step-by-step -step tutorials of how to integrate each part of your library, how to integrate each feature. Next is how to use your library, in what use cases you can apply your library, in what use cases, what problems your library or your service can solve. And third is, of course, an API reference for all your methods, all your public classes, that you can easily generate from Java docs, from Apple docs, from ASCII docs, whatever you are using for your code. And if you are look into all popular documentation, like Android has the same structure, Twilio has the same structure, we use the same structure. Just follow those three simple parts of the documentation and 
you'll get much less questions in your support tickets. Now, quick question. How do you think, what is wrong with, the sni with this snippet of the code? Like in the, you saw this in the documentation. What can be wrong with this snippet of the code? Correct. We, like, if you spot this uh, snippet of the code in your documentation, what developers usually do, what I usually do, I just copy paste it. And first, we are not sure what is Git Social. Okay, if you are in Git Social documentation, we can have some assumptions. But if you'll just copy paste it to our code, it's not going to compile because Git Social is undefined variable. And we are going to get those er annoying errors. So when you are building your snippets of the code, try to make them easy to understand. And if developer, like you have to make an assumption that developer is just going to copy paste the snippet of the code and try to provide snippets in a way that they are going to compile right after the copy pasting, like this one. There is much more aspects of documentation development. Like recently, Google published their develop Google Developers Documentation Style Guide. It's huge. It covers each and every aspect of documentation, like what grammar you should use, what tone you should use, like how to provide snippets of the code. Like it covers all those annoying parts that we as developers don't like to write. In a, but the good part, it's very structured. And you can easily select on the parts that you like. Like the most helpful part for me was in which tone you should communicate in your documentation with, the, with your clients. Should it be, hey, copy this code and let's make this feature amazing? Or it should be more formal. Like, please copy this code. Like, so this tone of, the, of your documentation is also greatly covered in the Google Developers Documentation Style Guide. And you'll need some engine for your documentation to host. It can be GitHub Wiki. Again, if you're hosting on a GitHub, it can be Jekyll, like static uh, website generator that provides where you can write all your documentation, mark down, and just apply documentation team, and it's just going to look amazing. Or we at Get Social, we use MKDocs. It's just a simple tool. You write all your documentation in Markdown, and you can provide simple Ruby plugins to do some magic around your documentation. It's very flexible and it look, has amazing teams. And question to you. After the documentation, what is the next favorite source of copy-pasting code for us? <laughs> hey, you were pretty much right. But when you're just publishing the library, most likely people won't find answers in the Stack Overflow. And it's good to provide some kind of reference application for your application of library that is going to show how you can use, where developer can, okay, I didn't find this in documentation, but I can dig into like working prototype of using this library and quickly copy paste or quickly experiment in this library. So it's good to ship always a library with some demo applications that is going to show off and give a developer a quick option, quick way to try your library. Like in our documentation, you can quickly go to a Google Play and download and play with all the features in our demo app. One thing in the, when you write your demo application, make sure that those snippets of the code, the code that you write there is first. It's well documented. Like you actually make a section, you separate it in a separate classes or whatever st clear structure you provide to make it simple to understand in which part of the code should I look like, should, should I look at to find the functionality I'm looking for. And keep the integration code, the interaction with your library separately for your, with UI implementation, with handling lifecycle. So developer, when he looks at the code, he sees on the only the interaction with your library and not the integration uh, not the handling of the application logic itself. Okay, now let's talk about support in a more detailed way. So you got a support request. You, some, some one of the clients integrated your library 
and one of the beautiful mornings you get a support request from your client. There are two types of support requests you are going to get usually. First is a support request during the integration time. Like developers actively start integration with your library or a service and he got some problem on the integration process and he asks you for help with that. Or another situation when developer saw some crash report in his Google Play developer console and he reports that crash to you. Let's start with how you can help your clients during the integration time prob problems. First thing is to provide to your clients is the easy way to collect all the information possible about your library, like your library version, all the logs from your library, like all the integration use cases. Like you can, pro like I highly recommend to create a separate uh, log cat tag so you developers can filter out all the logs that are related only to your library. And you know what I have to say? I don't know why, I still don't know why. Clients are parano paranoid, 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 they have some paranoia about sharing logs with us. I don't know, they don't understand that we can just download the application from the Google Play and see all the Android logs or what, but you'll face that clients don't want to share the output, the entire output of the logcat with you. They'll ask you uh, for a way to filter only logs related to your library, and they're going to share only your logs with you. It's happening like in two thirds cases that we get from our clients. So provide a simple way to provide a, a unique tag that you can filter all the logs related to your library. For a developer. Another thing that you don't want to show so many logs, like you can see here on the screenshot about like all network requests, all internals that are happening in the a library when you are shipping your library to production. You don't want to see all these details in the production library and production apps. So what we did, we have, uh, we in a production apps by default we enable only warning and above logs. And if developer want to enable all the debug logs that are going to help us to help him, we ask him to enable debug mode for application. And Android is amazing with that. You can set just a system property, and with a bit of magic, you can read this system property, the bucket social something, and enable your logs if this property is set or not. Like one note about the bug properties, about system properties. As a developer, you can uh, set on the, only the properties that have prefix debug or log dot something. Any other property you won't be able to set, you won't have permission to set it as a developer. And one more thing is when the, about exceptions that you are throwing from your library. When you're throwing exception from a library, what we used to have, we had get social ex exception happened. And maybe some like message that with more details, but the problem with message, even if it is detailed, that you are throwing out of your library is that it's not actionable for developer. Developer is not going to parse the message to do some action, like to either log this exception to his analytics or to crash the application or whatever he wants to do. Instead, provide some way that developer can, can distinguish like, critical errors, non-critical errors, non like, network errors, like whatever exceptions or errors you're going to throw from your application. Like in our case, we are using error codes because most part of our exception uh, all our errors are connected to our backend, and we just forward the error code we get from the backend. In your case, it can be the hierarchy of exceptions or whatever is going to work for you better, but provide a way for developer to distinguish between critical, non-critical, and other types of exceptions you are throwing. Now let's talk about how to solve user problems. Like when exception happens when application was already shipped to, your, to the users. First is comprehen comprehensive logs, because usually you are going to get a stack trace or a dump of the system from Crashlytics or something like that, and you want to have there as much information as possible. So make your messages com 
where both provide useful information there instead of saying saying that, the, that the value was wrong, say that value of the variable max size was too big or something like that, provide comprehensive messages that are going to help you to debug the problem faster. And provide some error analytics. If you are developing an application, if you are an owner of application, you can easily embed crash analytics or service like that to report errors. And you, can, you will get this collection of all your exceptions that are happening on the client side almost for free. But if you are developing a library, you're not going to include Crashlytics or Firebase inside your library to collect logs. And what we did, we wrote a very simple layer to collect all the, analyti all the error analytics events. Like I mentioned earlier that we have the silent execution policy. And first thing that the silent execution policy in production library is doing logs the, the exception to the log and report, uh, reports it to our backend. So later on, we can go to a sumo logic. We use sumo logic to collect all the logs and see nice graphs of like, which SDK versions have the most am amount of errors, like which errors are the most common, which clients face the, most amount, the biggest amount of errors. And besides building nice graphs, Sumo logic allows you to write queries, a comprehensive queries to select only the useful part of logs for you. So you can analyze and tackle the problems faster. The key takeaway from the support section. You have to think about support ahead, ahead of releasing your library. What we did with our SDK version 4, now we are on 6, we just pushed it and then we started getting all the support tickets and to solve the problems was a huge pain in this. It took a lot of time to collect all the information, to find the right the conditions to reproduce the error. Now when we have Sumo logic and we see that amount of errors of certain types type is in increasing, we have alerts set it up and we can react to them, we can fix them before the clients are going to report those errors to us. We can notice errors just by setting up alarms in our analytic analytics before our clients are going to notice that. And same applies for solving integration time problems. And if developer faces a problem, you fix some problem, you're going to release an update for your library. And usually when somebody says that our library is ready for update, they just say, just download it. Download, drop in solution, and it's going to work. Usually not a case. Usually you update the library and it gets some compilation errors, some other errors, some unexpected behaviors, and you again get to the state when you want to kill everything and everyone around. So think about how you're going to provide smooth updates to your developers. And by smooth updates, I mean uh, setting proper expectations. It's not about like keeping compatibility for all the time, it's about setting proper expectations for your developers. How to do that? First, use the deprecation cycle. If you are having some method and you want to change a signature of the method, release a version of a, you can add a new method, keep the old one and just mark it as deprecated. Mark it as deprecated and the key part says the developer in which version of the library is going to be removed completely. Second, use semantic versioning. By s I believe everyone is familiar with semantic versioning, right? No? Okay. Uh, semantic versioning. The idea is very simple. We have three numbers. We have our bug fix number. Bug fix is where we fix all the small issues. We don't introduce no new features. We just fix bugs. And as the case stays perfectly backward compatible in minor releases. We add new features. SDK still stays compatible. It's a drop-in solution you want to update. You drop new library, no compilation errors, everything is smooth. And only in the major, major releases, we allow ourselves to remove, o remove old API, to change the behavior. So only in major releases, you can do some breaking changes to your libraries. Another useful thing you can do with your, like for upgrade process is, is something called version packages. 
Like this approach is used by OKHTTP, OK and we were also considering that. Basically, when you're releasing new version of library, just put all the code into the uh, package name with certain version. In our case, it didn't make much sense, but in case of OKHTTP, OK it can make perfect it can make perfect sense. Imagine that. You have your application on a live for a couple of years. You, all your communication is done with OKHTTP2. OK and then new shiny OKHTTP3 OK released. But it's in early stage. You don't know how good is that. Is it reliable? What you can do, if you have a version packages, you can import at the same time OKHTTP2 OK and OKHTTP3 OK and start making only certain calls or do A-B testing and switch your communication protocol for some of the users to OKHTTP3. OK and if something goes bad, just fall back to the OKHTTP2. OK so with version packages, you can do first partial transition. Like part of the API can be, like part of the functionality can migrate to a new version of the library, part can stay on the old one. And it's, you provide an easy way for developers to do an A-B testing for your applications. Next about setting expectations. You have a changelog. You have a changelog where you clearly state which, fix, which issues were fixed, which new features were added, what you plan to deprecate or you already deprecated, and provide a simple upgrade guide if you had any breaking changes. Like our uh, get social upgrade guide usually is very basic. We just provide a link to a general upgrade guide, but if you have any breaking changes, we are going to list it directly in a changelog so developer can quickly see, okay, there is something changed, I need to take care of that. To sum up. Don't fall asleep, I see you. In average, mobile applications and games integrate up to 17 SDKs. Just imagine that. 17 libraries. And each requires integration process, each requires support, each requires some maintenance. If your application is going to crash because of some library, what you are going to do? You are going to just remove it. And you as a library developer, as a service provider, you are going to lose your client. You have to make sure that not only you spend your time, not only on development of the library, but you think ahead about each and every step of the your customer journey of how your library is going to be used, how it's going to be integrated, how it's going to be, how you're going to provide support to your users, how you're going to update your library. You have to think about all this way ahead before the releasing of the library. I highly encourage you when you're going to get back on Monday to your work and you start working your, back on your project. Wait for a second, get a cup of coffee, sit back, and think how your product will be used by your customers. Put yourself in your customer's shoes. Try to integrate your library. Try to use your application how your customers are going to use it. Get to the real use cases scenario, real locations where your application or library is going to be used. You're going to get so many insights that you won't you can't even imagine. Use all those tips and make your clients Happy again. Thank you. Okay, let, let's, let's get started with the questions. Uh, how does your continuous integration for SDK should look like? Okay, uh, so the question is about continuous integration, how our pipeline looks like. Uh, we use Gitflow approach, so we have master branch where the code is always stable is and ready to be shipped. We have develop branch where code is stable and kind of ready to be shipped. And we have feature branches. As soon as we start working on the new feature, feature branch is created. Like you work on that, you create a pull request. Then at least one team member should approve the pull request. And our continuous integration server should approve the pull request. We have two Jenkins nodes set it up. Uh, one master node that is working all the time and slave node that is helping from time to time. Uh, we, on the 
our Jenkins, we do all the integration tests. Like our, we have all our unit tests that are running on one of the Jenkins node. Uh, like unit tests, integration tests, like uh, if our API is working correctly, integration tests in connected mode. Like when we actually call real API, our integration tests with our mocked servers to make server to make calls to make the int tests run fast. But we also have our automation test Jenkins. That's the third Jenkins that is handled not by development team but handled by our Q uh, like quality assurance automation team. And they have, I believe, last time I checked was 47 uh, test suits that cover each and every aspect of our library. Like it. Is the way how we work, we, when we start working on the new feature, we develop a use case scenario. How, devel how clients are going to use our feature. And while development team is working on implementing the feature, QA automation team starts building fixtures, start building uh, like automation test cases for those scenarios. So at the end, when feature development is done, we push everything to Jenkins, we val validate that development is done, code is ready to be pushed to production. And then QA team is running all their use cases, high level tests, and only when we get green light from both sides, we can push stuff to master or to production. Like if you're interested in what devices we are testing, we are testing in pretty much everything that is available on AWS uh, device farm for major releases, uh, for minor and major releases, we run our, all our test suits on all available devices, and that takes a hell of a lot of time. Like our test, entire test suite on all devices on Amazon Cloud takes like half a day, maybe a bit more. But if you do only bug fix releases, we run only on our local test farm, which has only three or four devices, it depends on what we are actually testing. Any particular question about CI? Okay, we can move on. Uh, second question, how can you investigate if behavior issue or reported by user? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, so how we can Im investigate that something is going wrong in logic? Uh, particularly in our case, we have analytics set it up. Like I mentioned about error analytics, but besides error analytics, we collect a lot of data about behavior of the user inside the application. And we, ca we collect like all the information about your device, so we can easily replicate the environment you are working at. We collect all your steps, like when you initialize the, initialize the application, when you started interacting with our application, which methods did you call. So we doesn't have like the complete picture of your flow, because that's just way too much data, at least more data than we can handle at the moment. But we have these key points of interactions with our library, locked in our analytics system. And for our backend, we use Redshift. And if you need to investigate some particular case, we can just use your IDFA and see all the analytics related to your IDFA, like unique, ID, unique advertisement ID for your device, and to find the analytics related to your application, and plus logs, of course. And the last question, uh, what criteria have you have to meet the dependencies that you include in your library? Oh, that's a good question. What criteria dependencies should meet to in be included in our library? The answer is very simple. Don't use any dependencies. You're going to regret that when you integrate that. You're going to regret it later. I'm going to tell you a story. I believe we have time for a short story. On the third version of our library, we used to have a chart functionality. And we used one of the chart providers, like we were embedding a library for chat into our library. I'm not going to name the library, but that was such a big pain in the ass. First, we didn't have any control of the source code. That means that if our clients see the problem, if they see a crash or some mis misbehavior, they report to us, we report to them. And this loop can take up to a month to fix a simple crash. Second, you don't have control over the size of the library. Like if you are developing a library, you really have to take care about the size. I know that we have now devices with 100 gigabytes storage and stuff like that, but still, if you are especially working on Android and especially if you're working for Unity market, for Unity is a game engine, up to the latest version of Unity, they didn't know how to handle 
they couldn't enable multi-dex, which means you have exactly 65k misets to feed all your application. That means that forget about Google Play services, or at least big part of Google Play services, and if you don't have control over the libraries that you include, you cannot like, cut out everything you don't use and use only the basic parts that you need. Nowadays, luckily for us, we cut out like all third-party libraries. We still use ARX, but modified version of ARX, like Air version of ARX that has only basic part for error handling and observers. We cut out everything else. Like our ARX library is like 400 misses. Basically, try to in-house everything. I understand that it, when you start, that's a big investment. But if you have a chance, or in later stages, try to in-house like, all possible parts of your stack. You'll have much more control of that. Thank you, Vitaly. Uh, if you have any other questions, ask them in the speaker's corner. And that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>